Hello, everybody. Welcome back to International Trade. I'm very excited today to finish our three lectures on the Actualine model with the Actualine model and the analysis of the China shock. Right? We're going to study, we're going to apply what we learn in these three lectures to understand and interpret uh, the effects of China's entrance in the WTO. In particular, today we're going to apply everything we learned in the previous two lectures, and in particular, we're going to apply the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. Right? And recall that the Stolper-Samuelson theorem states that an increase in the relative price of a good will increase the real return to the factor used intensively in that good. Right? So if the price of the labor-intensive good increases, workers are better off. The real return, the real wage, increases. Whereas the other factor is worse off. The real return to the other factor, in this case, capital, will decrease. So this will be very important because basically when we study the Exchelin model, we know that international trade is going to uh, affect the prices. Right? And by affecting the prices, it will affect the wages and the rental on capital. Right? And will affect the prices in the same way that trade affected prices in the Ricardian model. So that your comparative advantage good becomes more expensive, so you will export it. And so evidently, the factor of production used intensively in the production of your comparative advantage good will be better off. Okay? And shortly, we're going to see which is your comparative advantage good. We're also going to use the Rybzinski theorem. The Rybzinski theorem states that an increase in a factor endowment will increase the output of the industry using it intensively and will decrease the output in the other industry. We're going to use this theorem to get us some intuition for why countries with different endowments may produce different bundles of goods. And so, because, say, one country is labor abundant, it will have a production possibility frontier which is more skewed towards the labor intensive good, whereas the capital abundant country will have a production possibility frontier, which is, which is more skewed towards the capital intensive good. All right, now we are ready to begin with the actual in model. We're going to have two countries, home and foreign, and we're going to think that home is labor abundant. Okay, so uh, we're going to be, uh, say, China in this example. Okay, so home is labor abundant, foreign is capital abundant. Home is labor abundant because it has more workers per machines in total. Uh, industry one is labor intensive, as we uh, mentioned, as we assumed throughout these uh, slides. And then as always, we're gonna start first looking at autarky, and we're gonna move to free trade, and then we're gonna look at the welfare effects of trade. Autarky. Well, there's going to be a home production possibility frontier and uh, a certain uh, equilibrium. Right? Same thing for the foreign economy. Now, notice here that we're drawing the two production possibility frontiers in the two countries in, in a different way. Right? Why is that? Well, the home economy is labor abundant. So its production possibility frontier is going to be skewed towards the labor-intensive good, good one, by the Rybzinski theorem. Similarly, for the foreign economy, the foreign economy is capital abundant. So the production possibility frontier is going to be skewed towards the production of the capital-intensive good, Y2. So what can we say about the two relatively, relative autarky prices? Well, here we're going to make a, uh, a graphical argument for the fact that the autarky price at home of good one is lower than abroad. So home is labor abundant. The price of the labor intensive good at home is cheaper than abroad. Right? So it's sort of intuitive, right? You may think, okay, so if we are labor abundant, we have a lot of workers, right? So perhaps uh, these workers are going to be cheaper, right? Because we have so many of them. And so the price of the good that uses these workers intensively 
is going to be lower. Right? So this, this makes sense. You can also think of it as a, uh, if you have more workers, the relative supply of labor increases, uh, and as a result, you produce relatively more of the labor-intensive good. And therefore, the labor-intensive good is abundant, and therefore, it's cheaper. Well, let's see this graphically. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to draw the home production possibility frontier. And on top of that, we will also consider the equilibrium in autarky. Okay, so I'm going to draw any you know, reasonable, at least, uh, price line. And now on top of that, we're going to draw the foreign production possibility frontier, which again is going to be skewed towards the capital intensive good. Now, what happens now? Well, now is where the uh, assumption of homothetic preferences comes in. So if preferences are homothetic, the budget share, the relative consumption of the two goods, does not change depending on income. Right? So if the home economy, with, with its own autarky prices, P1 over P2 over A, is consuming this point here, that, in, that means that uh, given the relative prices, P1 over P2, A, the consumption, the relative consumption of the two goods will be along this ray from the origin. Okay, so if you have lower income, you're, uh, you're over here. If you have higher income, you're over there. But so long as the prices are the one you see at home in autarky, you will be consuming somewhere along that line. Okay? So what if this price were to be happening in the foreign economy? Well, if the same price line that you have at home, you have it abroad, well, you want to draw a price line which is tangent to the production possibility frontier, because that's where you can actually produce, and, and the consumption would be at point A. But production would be at point B. So this would be a disequilibrium, right? Because B must be equal to A in other case. So what we have here is that when you impose the other key prices abroad, you cause an excess demand for good one. And if there is an excess demand for good one, the price of good one will increase. Okay. Okay. So this basically means that the home economy is labor abundant, is the cheapest producer of the labor intensive good. So this means that the home economy is as a comparative advantage in the labor intensive good. Similarly, the foreign economy has a comparative advantage in the capital intensive good. Okay? So when we think back about the comparative advantages of Denmark, uh, you know, you think of dairy products. Here we have two possible sources of comparative advantage. One comparative advantage is the Ricardian one is based on technology. So you may think that Denmark has a comparative advantage in dairy production because it has a relatively better technology. In contrast, if you apply the actual lean model, Denmark has a comparative advantage in the production of dairy because it is abundant in the factor of production used intensively in the production of dairy, whatever that might be. Perhaps it's cows. <coughs> and so you can think of if Denmark has a comparative advantage in dairy production, it has more cows per workers right, than other countries. OK. Now let's look at what happens with free trade. So the price under free trade will be between the two autarky prices for the same reason that we saw in the Ricardian model. And so if we look at the home economy, what we see is that the price of the comparative advantage good will increase. Hence, we will produce more of it. Right? So we're going to move along the production possibility frontier and produce more of Y1. That's what production is. Notice that we don't have full specialization. Right? In contrast to the Ricardian model here, not all workers and capital go produce in industry one. And that is because of the diminishing marginal returns. Right? Even if you keep on moving workers and machines, to industry one, their marginal productivity will eventually decline.
consumption is going to be the uh, the tangency point between the indifference curve and the budget line. Right? And so you can see, as always, uh, your production differ from your consumption. And thanks to trade, you can consume uh, uh, at a higher indifference curve. So overall, utility of the country increases. So here we have uh, the imports and export. And now we can look at the foreign economy. And uh, again, for the foreign economy, good one is becoming cheaper. So the price line is going to become flatter. And because of that, the foreign economy is going to specialize partially, not fully, in the production of good too, the capital intensive good. That's where production is going to be. It's going to be a new consumption point at a higher indifference curve. And then you have the exports and inputs. Right, so again, pretty much it's just like the Ricardian model, when countries trade, they're better off. Right, they specialize in the good in which they have a comparative advantage in. Here it's because of different factor endowments. So labor in abundant countries specialize in labor intensive goods and capital abundant countries specialize in capital intensive goods. They trade those goods for the other and both countries are better off. Okay, so that's beautiful, right? That means that trade is not a zero sum game because when two countries, if Denmark and uh, China trade, uh, they're both gonna be better off. There's gonna be some differences in the uh, relative in, in, in the relative wage and, and relative to the rental on capital, right? Before we look at that, I just state the actual in theorem, which is, this is a beautiful sentence uh, Eli Axios and Bertie Lollin are the two economists that uh, sort of provided the, the theories for this result. And so what we have is that each country will export a good that uses its abundant factor intensively. So this is beautifully summarized. Right? So the labor abundant country exports the labor intensive good and vice versa for the capital abundant country. But what about inequality? <music> Here's where the stopper Amazon theorem comes in. Because as we said, for the home economy, it's as if the price of good one increases after trade. So if the price of the labor intensive good increases, the labor abundant labor in the labor abundant country will be better off. So for the foreign economy, it's the capital intensive good which increases its price. So there, the capital owners will be better off, according to the stopper Amazon theorem. So what we say here is that when two countries trade, the abundant factor in each country is going to gain, and the other is going to lose. So to think about examples here, let's look at the case of robots. Okay. So this is actually data that I took from the research of a colleague of mine, Frederick Verzinski. And uh, in this figure, I'm uh, plotting the stock of robots in manufacturing in three countries, Denmark, Germany, and China. And so you can think if somebody that hasn't taken the actual in uh, uh, lecture sees this figure and is from Denmark or even from Germany, gets desperate, right? Say, oh my God, Chinese are going to take us over, right? Because they have so many robots. Of course, this figure doesn't mean much because what matters is not the absolute number of robots that you have. It's actually the relative number of workers per worker. So you have a robot intensity measure. You see that Denmark is between Germany and China. And this robot intensity is increasing everywhere. So if we think that Denmark trades with China, well, Denmark is robot abundant, right? So uh, Denmark will export the robot intensive good, whatever that might be, and China instead will export the labor intensive good. Now, by the stopper Samuelson theorem, this means that workers in Denmark in Denmark will be worse off, and robot owner in Denmark. Robot owners in Denmark will be better off. Okay, so trade does increase income inequality in Denmark if we think that robot owners are richer than workers. And they probably are. 
In contrast, in China, the opposite happens. China export the labor intensive good, so workers in China will be better off. And it's the robot owners in China that will be worse off. Okay? Now, this is very important to know because uh, after listening to that, lots of people in Denmark may say, well, why should we trade with China? If you're a worker, why would you want to trade with China when you know that your wage will be lower? Right? Now, we see in the future lectures that that perhaps is not as clear cut and also in uh, some slide, right? But this, this is an important result of the actual model. So what can we do about that? Because you may think that uh, workers may decide to vote for somebody that does not want to trade with China. And remember the US. And, and that is a legitimate position for them, right? However, we know that trade is not a zero sum game. We know that both countries are better off in aggregate after trading, because we saw that the utility goes up. So what's at stake here is that we need to find a way to redistribute the gains from trade. Right? The gains must go from those that gain, uh, the robot owners in our example, to the workers. How does that happen? Well, that happens in several ways, right? It happens with several ways. It, it happens with uh, progressive taxations. It happens with uh, actual programs that sort of compensate for job losses or retrain workers after there is a trade shock and other similar uh, redistributive policies. And this brings us to the China shock. Now, China in 2001 entered the WTO. We'll see in a few lectures that entering the WTO basically means a, a great reduction in tariff barriers from N2, the other members of the WTO. This means that when China enters the WTO, it's very easy for China to export to the other members of the WTO, but also for the other members of the WTO, it becomes much easier to export to China. Right? That entrance of China in the WTO has been associated with uh, a worldwide decline in the uh, share of unemployment in manufacturing. So in this figure, if we look at the United States, we see that uh, manufacturing in, an, in, um, in uh, sorry, employment in manufacturing, sort of stable, perhaps slightly declining in the 90s. And then there's been a huge uh, decline from uh, pretty much 2001 till the Great Recession in 2009. And then there's been a, sl a slight uh, growth again. Okay, so this, this, there is this decline in manufacturing employment, right? but let's not confuse that with actually a reduction in manufacturing production. Because as you can see in this figure, the total output in manufacturing is always increasing. It all, always declines in recessions. Okay? So you see here in the 90s, it is increasing. There is a recession in 2001, as we saw in the very introductory lecture, and then manufacturing output increases, right? While the employment declines, okay? So it's not like manufacturing has gone, it's that the jobs have been reduced in numbers. Like the guard jobs! They took your jobs! And there is a decline again in during the Great Recession, and then there's growth again. What about Denmark? Is Denmark any different? Well, not really. And so uh, here, unfortunately, the data that I found uh, available online was uh, at a shorter time span, but you can also see that there's been a decline in uh, manufacturing employment uh, after, during the Great Recession, right? and then a, a slight uptake after that. And this is for the industrial production index. And again, you can see that there's been sort of a, an increase from 2000 till 2007, then a reduction after the, the Great Recession, and then a growth again. Okay. So after China entered the WTO, some jobs have gone, right? But let's not forget that manufacturing production has been increasing nonetheless. This is basically the China shock or the China syndrome. Now, uh, the focus on this is motivated both by, say, the news and politics. After all, we've had 
uh, you know, the president, presidency of Donald Trump, right? That had the exact purpose of limiting trade with China. Now you may think, oh, that was bad. Yes, it was, but we see it's actually not, it's not unmotivated. And in particular, in 2013, uh, these three economists, author Don Hanson, uh, really made a lot of waves with this uh, paper of theirs that, um, yeah, remember that I was doing my PhD then, everybody uh, in class was talking about it because it came out, it had new techniques, it had this uh, geographical attention, uh, geographical focus that was uh, not seen before, and also had a huge impact on uh, in the news. And so, and so the motivation for that paper was simply this correlation that you see in the data. You see that there's an increase in the import penetration rate from China. So they, if you take the ratio of imports from China uh, relative to, uh, could be uh, total US imports, could be total US uh, consumption, or several way of defining import penetration. Here's uh, for uh, uh, domestic consumption. You see it's been increasing. And at the same time, the share of employment in manufacturing had also been declining. Right? So you may think, okay, uh, one thing causes the other, but you know that that's not uh, correct, right? Correlation does not imply causation. And so uh, how could we infer a certain causality between the import penetration ratio of China and the manufacturing employment? Well. Unfortunately, the three uh, authors uh, did not write a, a Vox uh, paper, on, a Vox article on this paper, but there is another paper uh, that is on uh, Vox, which is basically a follow-up. As you can see, there is the same authors. There is David Otter, Dorn, and Anson, and two more, uh, Asemoglu, who's uh, another giant uh, in economics, and uh, Brandon Price. And basically, Again, the motivation here uh, is uh, to figure out whether China is responsible for uh, uh, the loss of jobs in the US. Right? So has China taken the US jobs? They took our jobs! They took our jobs! They took your jobs! Job. 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 Well, we know that, you know, this is the reason why I put this article in the reading list is also because it it, it, it links very nicely with the actual in theory. Right? So we see that in the article, the authors reference the China reforms. So the allowing privatization, uh, the move away from uh, the centralized planning of a communist country towards more of a uh, liberal uh, and capitalistic economic system. Right? Especially in international trade, for instance, imagine that there were quotas to export. Right, that they were liberalized in 2003, 2004. And right, so only after that, private companies were able to almost freely export as they pleased. So these Chinese reforms brought about a comparative advantage for China, okay, made it possible for China to have a comparative advantage in say manufacturing sectors, which are relatively more labor intensive. And so the sector expander output uh, by the store percent, by the actual in theorem, China will export the uh, labor intensive good. The US will import the labor intensive good. And in the US, the production of labor intensive good will decline. By the store percent of theorem, this means that workers in the US will be worse off. So, um, you know, there are a few uh, innovations relative to our framework. You know, they allow for linkages across industries, by up, upward and downward linkages. The fact that industries, you know, the car industry uses inputs from uh, the plastic industry as well. And, uh, and they also look at other improvements relative to our model, right? But the basic idea here is that uh, the China shock affects the US in the same way, but different regions in the US are exposed differently to the Chinese shock. Right? So some sectors in some locations tend to import more, tend to suffer more from the import competition because in that 
particular county, for instance, uh, there is a predominance of production of manufacturing output, right, which is more affected by the Chinese competition than, say, the production of uh, uh, ideas or research and development uh, in the uh, in Silicon Valley. Okay, so this is the basic idea. They compare the effects of China across different locations in the U.S. And they also do other things, but you know we have to keep it simple here, also because the some of the techniques that they use require econometrics knowledge that you are currently studying for the first time. So what their message is is that. The import growth of China, from China, from 99 to 2011, caused a reduction in employment, in employment by 2.4 million workers. Okay. So China did took away some U.S. jobs. Not all of them. Let's recall from this figure that employment in manufacturing went from you know, about 17 million to 12 million, so this is about 5 million jobs, maybe more, right, uh, that have gone, and uh, the Chinese uh, only accounts for 2.4 million of those, according to Otto Donaldson. So this is an important result. Okay? And uh, using this result, uh, one could argue reasonably that you shouldn't trade with China, because otherwise that's going to cost, cost jobs. When the original article of author Don Hanson came out, you know, we were all very excited by it because it was uh, a very an impressive quantitative exercise. But I was honestly a little bit surprised by the uh, surprise that a lot of people manifested in the results. And after all, uh, in the second model that we study in the international trade, uh, we see that if you trade with a labor abundant country and you're a capital abundant country, workers will be worse off. Okay? So there is, no, there is no surprise. But there was one thing that was missing in this story, right? Here we're just looking at the import side of things. So if, if the US start trading with China, well, it's no surprise that some jobs are gonna, are gonna be uh, changing, right? Because China will produce more of the labor-intensive good, the US will produce less of the labor-intensive good, so there will be less jobs in the labor-intensive sectors that are morally, mainly affected by China's competition. But the other side of the story is that the US will also export. So there's going to be a growth in the jobs of the exporting sector, the ones in which the US has a comparative advantage in. And that is what Finstra, Ma, Sazahara, and Chu actually show in this paper. So Finstra, you know, is the uh, author of the textbook. Hong Ma is, uh, I met him once, he was actually a graduate student of Finstra in, uh, in Davis a uh, few years before me. Uh, I don't know Yuan Chu, but I know Akira Sazahara, we actually were roommates in uh, Davis for uh, almost two years. And so uh, what this article is showing is simply that once you also take into account exports, the China shock has a different flavor. Okay? It's obvious that in the importing industries, the industries that import more from China, right? so this would be the industries that produce the labor intensive good, it's not surprised there's going to be job losses. However, in the exporting industries, there will be job gains, right? If the U.S. moves along its production possibility frontier from the labor-intensive sector to the capital-intensive sector, it's an accounting identity, right? That the number of workers in the labor-intensive sector will decline and the number of workers in the capital-intensive sector will increase, okay? So the question is, well, is this gonna, is, are these two effects gonna net out? Because that's what we expect in the actual model where we have full employment, right? Because this is a long run model. Well, their accounting exercise shows that 
as the author uh, paper. There's a loss of 2 million jobs in importing industries because of the, of the, of the trade shock of China, but there's also an increase in pretty much the same number of jobs in exporting industries, okay? So the two effects net out nicely. However, there's an additional positive effect. There's a, an increase of 4.5 million jobs in the service sectors. Right? Perhaps these are sectors, these are consulting sectors that help companies ex export, right? Or perhaps these are other, um, you know, the fact that you have to uh, control a global value chains or you have to uh, sort of provide additional services to now bigger companies because of international trade. Okay. So this is very nice because this is showing that indeed when we trade with China, some jobs are lost, but also other jobs are gained. And overall, the net effect seems to be positive. But this doesn't mean that, um, you know, we cannot show this paper to people and say, okay, so we should always trade with China. Because obviously uh, there is the risk that the number of, you know, that the people that lost their jobs are not the same people that found their jobs, okay? Because perhaps some jobs were lost in a state and gained in another one, and there's not enough mobility across states to account for that. Okay, so there is still an important role for redistribution and an important role for somehow uh, reducing this, um, this, this mismatch in a way between the job growth in export sectors and the reduction in jobs in the import sectors. And this is what all the training and retraining programs that sometimes you hear about are all about. So that's it for today. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Ciao.